Thank you. Wow. Um, great to see the, the remnant. Um, thank you um, uh, for joining us. And yeah, we'll, it will be more interactive rather than, again, um, just a message. So feel free to um, uh, say something, or obviously I'll be uh, trying to engage you as well. So uh, we will interact together. Um, maybe before we go into um, the, the actual part of the presentation, uh, Lou mentioned that maybe some of you will be interested to learn a little bit about Russia. And I kind of, mm, I don't really talk much about it, but at times I know people are very um, curious or they just want to know uh, how it happened during communism and what's, what's it like now and how it all happened. Um, any interests? For me to, to share a little bit? Yeah? Uh, a lot. Okay. So how much time uh, will we allow for the, for the story? Uh, two hours? Or <laughs> okay. Let's, let's spend 10 minutes. Okay? 10 minutes. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll, um, we'll also allow um, for that. Um, <clears throat> I yes, I grew up in in Uzbekistan. Well, I was born in Uzbekistan, but then we went back to to Russia. My family, um, they were Seventh Day Adventists, so I'm fourth generation Seventh Day Adventist. Why I'm saying this? Not because I'm fourth uh, generation, but to kind of give you the the depth of of uh, the field, kind of how how many generations actually went through communism. And um, if you happen to be in our ABC, I'm not sure if they have it now, uh, two years ago there was a book that was um, actually the book of the month at some, at some stage, uh, which is called Even If the Heavens Fall. Uh, you will recognize it. It's got like um, the, the red flag with um, black and white image of, of a, a man standing uh, with, uh, with his wife. This book was written by my uncle, who unfortunately passed away uh, in 2011 uh, because of a brain uh, tumor. But he was retired, he was in his um, 80s. And, uh, and he was still up almost to the last day he was translating the Bible into Russian uh, because he, he, uh, he knew um, Hebrew and in, in, in Greek and English and, and Russian so he was um, uh, actually heading a whole institute of, of, of translation <clears throat> and uh, so he wrote this book he, uh, that, that's just to, to give you if you want to really read so many stories uh, here's a book for you to, to get a hold of um, technically the church was underground that's, that's the, the, the set up until um, um, Gorbachev. Yeah, when Gorbachev came, I believe God, and that we all in our family, we all believe that God brought him for a purpose because he truly allowed uh, people to be authentic and actually speak their mind. Yeah, and you know all these glasnosts, yeah. Uh, but the downside um, of that was because when you don't allow people to, to, you know, express their, their thoughts and suddenly freedom comes. What happens? They don't have the skill to handle it in an effective way. And suddenly, that's why you get a little bit of disaster. So there was a little bit of a challenge or challenging time, but uh, it actually uh, changed gradually and now the situation is, is way um, better. So let me go back. The church underground. Uh, the way, the way, like my um, granddad, he was in prison for 10 years just because he believed uh, and he was a pastor. Um, so they specifically target, targeted pastors. And all churches had their own um, uh, KGB agents who were either church members or were uh, even in, um, in pastoral ministry. So if, if there was, say, a meeting, um, so the KGBs knew where their meeting would be, they wouldn't really persecute church members, but they would go and persecute um, uh, the pastors because that, that was their idea. You, um, 
put in prison the pastor, get rid of all the pastors, and then parishioners will, will be scattered. Unfortunately, it was not the case, because um, a Seventh-day Adventist church, um, in contrary yeah, to, to many others, were, was very strong. And we are very strong in our own spiritual work. Yeah? We don't rely on the priest to tell us what to do. So they were other, either elders or other even pastors, because back then you didn't need to have a theological degree to become a pastor. So they were lay people who would uh, just uh, stand up to their task and lead the flock, and then they would become pastors. So technically KGBs, they couldn't do anything about it. They put, the more they put um, uh, people in prison, the more pastors would, would come out of nowhere. God was working in an, in an amazing way. In terms of evangelism, how the church uh, spread and grew um, in an amazing way, you were not allowed to evangelize. You couldn't hold a, a meeting, <laughs> as you can imagine. You couldn't even hold a pastor's meeting or, or even proper church meeting. So what the, the folks would do, they would nominate a, someone's home. And you can't have the same home every time. Because they'll say, hey, why would, you know, 30 people go into, you know, this home every Saturday? So it's kind of obvious. So what they would do, they would come up with a birthday party. And so, okay, Pastor Gary is going to have a birthday party and we'll, we'll go to his house. And it's going to be a real little birthday party, but it will be a church. <laughs> and so they will all go with, uh, with whatever, you know, present themselves as, as, um, as a birthday. And so the, the neighbors would just kind of know, yeah, they are having just a party. So next Sabbath it will be um, uh, Tony. Uh, will be like, okay, Tony's got a birthday, so we'll, we'll go to Tony for whatever reason. Maybe not birthday, maybe someone else's occasion. They would just come up with uh, real reasons to um, to celebrate uh, church, <clears throat> and they would relocate. The downside was when they had their own, the KGBs had their own people in um, in the, in the church. Because if you if you meet uh, half an hour later, you know a bus comes uh, comes by and loads all people. And they say, who is the leader there? Put the leader, put him in, in prison, and then uh, just um, ask people to go home. <clears throat> and um, so that, that, um, that's, that's, that was the, the life of the church. The, um, the ministers' meetings were also big weddings. So the ladies were actually also um, encouraged to come, but they were doing other things while brethren were um, um, having their own administrative meetings. There were uh, marvelous stories of how um, uh, also uh, KGBs were informed about, about a meeting. They, they come in and then someone would, because they had all the Bibles, uh, at times even there was a situation when um, the ministers' meeting, they were um, going to actually buy a house for a church member for church. So they had all the funds together. And there was no banks, yeah, now. So no one could just use the bank for, for this. Because if you, have, uh, if you have money, you really need to explain where you have money from. If you bought, bought a car, a uh, newish car, you know, the neighbor would want to know where you got the money. And if, in fact, you, you really didn't need to be Seventh-day Adventist or whatever to be in trouble. If someone, say, if some uncle, rich uncle, gave you some whatever money and you bought a car, the neighbor will ring and say, hey, you know, you need to check my uh, neighbor out because for some reason, you know, he's got some money. And so the people would seriously walk in and say, well, tell us where you got the money from. You know, you bought this new, a new car. Or even if you, you are dressed, you know, differently or, you know, you allowed something else. So it was a real tough time um, for, for people to just really live their life uh, because you really need to be the aver an average person. If you stand out, you know, you're going to get shot uh, because someone will you know, uh, ring and then report. So it's, um, he's, that, was, that was a challenge. But how the church, um, how the church grew was through uh, relationships with, um, with people. So the, obviously you cannot even talk to 
anybody about faith because you know the moment you say something you'll be he'll be in trouble so now the method that my family used was um, they they all read uh, just because they they loved reading uh, uh, books of Dostoevsky maybe um, you know all the and um, they were beautiful books um, with good um, moral um, uh, stories and and uh, in lessons and what they were doing they were talking to people about those this is Russian heritage everybody read those books at the time and they were kind of linking uh, some of the stories to spiritual aspects because they were actually spiritual those people they were also spiritual but they didn't say them up front they were using various stories to bring about spiritual values and so um, uh, like my granddad and and uncle and uh, and that they were using those stories to start a conversation with with people and then when the the um, the uh, conversation progressed they said hey you know why don't you come you know we have a book club at home you know we just do whatever have a cup I and and then they discuss and then suddenly you know Bible comes up and people are like oh I heard about the Bible you know never never knew you know or this is weird but by then they already see that hey you look normal because in the past they were slogans everywhere as as you drive like um, religion is drug for people right, right? so well, don't give us uh, oh we don't need God party is our God he's another slogan and all sorts of slogans really brain brainwashing people and suddenly you know um, the people are introduced with the, the concept of the Bible and they say oh, it's kind of you know be, be cautious but then they already have seen that you are normal you know you're very intelligent and you can talk about life so they are open to talk now about spiritual aspects and at this point yeah uh, people were uh, able to share, um, uh, and pastors and, and other people were able to share some Bibles, Bible stories or even show the Bible. And, and so many people were truly um, spiritual, deep in, the, in their heart, but they didn't want anybody to know. In fact, in our schools, in other schools uh, where, where we were, in, in my older um, brothers and sisters, they were talking to my uh, parents uh, privately. They say, don't ever, we, we know that we can trust you, don't ever tell anyone, but we, uh, we know that you are doing a, a great job. But they never um, kind of felt strong enough to step up and say, hey, I'm actually a believer as well. Th that's why when in, two in 1991 the Soviet Union collapsed and everybody uh, was allowed to speak and say uh, and, and really express their religious um, uh, beliefs, uh, when Mark Finley, the first evangelist that came to, to Russia, to Moscow, to conduct evangelistic crusade, he was running it in the heart of communism, in uh, the Kremlin. This is the top-notch venue, and uh, obviously you, you, you realize that communism had um, a pride of, of wealth and everything when it comes to communism. It must be best. Yeah, so that place was the the best place all, of all, you know, red carpet, everything almost gold. Yeah, so he was running this program there in this in this venue, right in the heart of Moscow, and it, it seats five thousand people. So when they open up, they expected five thousand people. They were ten thousand people. So they started, hey, you know what? We are going to run in two sessions, and they were running in two sessions. All of the two sessions were flat out um, uh, packed, and people were still standing outside um, listening. So within over a year period, from one church, it went to nine churches, because people were so hungry by hundreds. People were baptized by hundreds. Um, <clears throat> Some stories of how um, the church again uh, was working underground and how the church was really connecting with the, um, with in fact the government gradually to communicate the message that we're not anti-Soviet Union, you know, we're just uh, Christian believers. Uh, um, uh, th uh, this is how they, they did it. In fact, there was, there was a split in church. Uh, my uh, uncle was looking after one territory, so all of Russia was split into three territories. One was looked after 
by my uncle, another one my dad was looking after, another one was Siberia. And Siberian territory, they said, you guys are 666 because you are encouraging us to talk to the government. And everybody could appreciate them because the government persecuted them. But they were not able to kind of have this basic empathy, say, hey, if we had enough of kind of um, wisdom to actually go and introduce ourselves and say, hey, before you come and chase us, we are here to tell you that we want to pray for you. We don't hate you, and we will never undermine your regime, whatever. We just want to, um, uh, to pray for you as people. And th that was their idea. And they couldn't, they couldn't persuade the rest of the church to actually not condemn the government, but, but really uh, befriend them. Until um, um, the president before... Um, uh, Wilson, uh, Pastor Wilson, Ted Wilson's dad, uh, Neil, Neil Wilson before him, Pearson, uh, Pearson, no, 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 not, not Paulson, Pearson, Pearson, yes, he was the president. So he was the first president who came to Russia as, as a tourist. And so he located um, my, grand, uh, my uh, uncle at the time, and so he started kind of talking to, uh, to him, and they knew that everything was loaded with all the bugs and everything. So um, um, my uncle in invited him, he says, well, uh, let me show you uh, Moscow. And that was a way to kind of take him out of any kind of civilization. And they went to some pond, nowhere, no one knows where, and so they tried to almost strip everything off because they, they didn't know where all the bugs were, so they could uh, talk. And so they, they talked, and he was in fact the only pastor who could speak Russian or uh, English. And so they communicated, he told him all the, all the challenges, and he says, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go back to the hotel, and we're going to talk about how Seventh-day Adventist Church is supportive of what the Russian government is doing and how we would love to uh, pray for them. And the next day, we are going to make an effort, actually, and go and pray for them. So that was their plan. Why they did it? Because they knew that the, all of his um, hotel room was full of bugs. <laughs> and so they actually went there. They discussed their, their authentic and really plain and say, well, we're, we're actually in support. You know, we don't want to, undem to undermine anything. We're just really spiritual people. And he said, let us pray. And they had a long uh, session of prayer for the Russian government. <laughs> so the next day they actually went together. And, and, and uh, you know, like to pray and uh, with them, and and sort of they were like, what's going on? You know, now you're attacking us. <laughs> and then gradually, um, because of the general conference, the, the influence, um, it, it, uh, they influence the rest of the church and say, hey, it is actually okay to to go and pray for the government. You know, you are not now six 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 because you do it. And in fact, we need to be registered by the government. Whoa, some feathers were, went up, said, whoa, how come, you know, they persecute us, why would we go and, and register? So it's a long, um, uh, it was a long, long uh, process. Yeah, but um, uh, yeah, gradually it, um, it, um, it changed and um, in, uh, uh, after uh, 1991, it just went um, up so rapidly in terms of church growth and, um, and all the, um, Involvement of, of, uh, of the community as well, but now if you go to um, to most of places, especially in central um, Russia, if you if you go and run run a campaign, um, will be almost, in fact, maybe 99% just like in in New Zealand or Australia. People are secular, either they are Orthodox or they are secular. Like, come on, don't tell me about God. You know, I'm busy or atheist or whatever. So it, it has become very, very um, uh, challenging to, again, yeah, evangelize and win people for Christ. So it's kind of from underground to that gap. I want to actually use this as an opportunity to uh, thank 
New Zealand, I know some pastors like Pastor Jerry Matthews. He was one of the pastors, uh, the former uh, union president. He went uh, to, to Russia, to Kazan, as one of the evangelists. This is the, uh, the blessing of the worldwide church, the way the Seventh-day Adventist church is organized. Um, there was such a huge shortage of pastors and evangelists in, in Russia that they couldn't do the whole lot. And... Um, and this is why so many American and Australian and even Kiwi pastors that went to Russia to run all of those campaigns. And so there was a gap of, um, of up to 10 years that it was like, come on, bring it on, you know, give us more gospel. And, and the church successfully used this opportunity. Obviously, there was a, a downside because of huge flow of people um, maybe they were not as, as organized in terms of how we would um, have uh, loved them to be organized, but um, the main thing, they accepted the message. They accepted Jesus. Uh, and um, the churches were just organized like we are talking about church plant, you know, overnight. No training, you know, they did just come. Um, yesterday they were just, you know, new people. Today they are members. Okay, and they will have two or three uh, maybe elders. The rest will be all brand new people. So who's going to do Sabbath school? Okay, you'll do Sabbath school. You'll do uh, uh, preaching or you'll do. And so they were all automatically part of, of the church, active active members. So that was downside, but still it was the, uh, uh, the blessing because they were automatically engaged. Any questions? We'll, we'll close and switch to... Good question, yeah. Uh, um, other churches, they, they kind of went s gradually. There was no like rapid jump up in, in their influence. Uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church stood out by far, and everybody in the community, everybody uh, kind of knew of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, Baptist Church, um, in fact, Baptist Church, they were also underground. Yeah, and, and they were, they were uh, also, so many of them were faithful uh, to their uh, belief, um, but they, they kind of, they weren't as active or even proactive in their uh, faith. When it comes to, to other, say, Pentecostal or other evangelical uh, churches, they, they were maybe individuals, but they were not organized in any kind of group or whatever. They were just scattered around. So mainly there were Seventh-day Adventists and, and Baptists uh, that, in fact, they knew of each other. Um, yeah. Um, the Orthodox Church was underground, but, uh, into, sorry, it was unexistent. Yeah, all the temples and everything were, were, were ruined, and they never really professed or more battled or anything. They're like, okay, we'll, we'll just keep it in our heart, and they never practiced their faith except the yeah, Seventh-day Adventists and mostly Baptists. So does that mean that the Adventist Church in Russia are really quite strong compared with some of those other... Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. The, um, the challenge uh, with um, any Protestant church in Russia is if you are not Orthodox, yeah, if you are not Orthodox, people kind of think, oh, is this kind of sect? Yeah, so even now, when you are talking about, um, uh, say, it's in the Adventist Church, some people become a little bit uh, cautious. Even now, when I catch up with some Russian uh, people anywhere in Auckland, uh, when in Vicargal, we had a, a couple of families who were like, hey, you know, let's, let's kind of, you know, catch up and sort of get to know each other. And they're like, so, and when it comes to what do you do, I'm like, well, I'm a pastor. They like, what is pastor, you know? So it's like priest. For them, you need to be a priest of an Orthodox church. It means you need to have a big beard, a long beard, and you know a big, you know, big tummy, be a big kind of long hair, and have this this kind of um, with all the you know, the incense, you know. Uh, so they are that image, and they look at you, say, "Well, you are young, don't have, don't look like a priest, and you are a pastor." And when you tell them that, "Hey, I'm a Seventh Day Adventist," that's another downside. They're saying, "Oh, is this kind of some kind of you know Western sect?" Uh, there, so uh, 
Yeah, I kind of don't bring it up straight up when I'm when I talk to um, Russian people because they uh, they have misconception on this. But now it 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 changes significantly, so it's oh, it's very hard to uh, to work in uh, the field of evangelism. How about uh, this, uh, Lou? You be okay? Okay. Uh, we can chat more if, if, if you want to, uh, we'll hang out. At this stage, um, we already prayed, thank you so much, um, uh, Pastor Gary. Let's, um, let's go into our um, topic. I'll, uh, what I want to, um, uh, to cover is the aspect of mental health or how our mind works and how our mind actually affects our relationships and, in fact, our spirituality. Before we go into this, do you have any... Uh, questions based on the morning uh, session. Any any sort of feedback? Can I tell you the um, in an example, an illustration, why I approach relationships from the angle of emotional health? When I was when we lived um, in Armenia, that's another place where we lived. Uh, because dad, well, dad was, was moving from uh, Uzbekistan, we went to Armenia. We had a couple of trees of apricots. And those apricots, whether I was too little, but the apricots looked massive to me. Real big apricots. And, and we loved them. We could, we could uh, pack a number of boxes just from one tree um, uh, once a year during, during the season. And once one of the trees started to show some uh, signs of sickness, a couple of branches uh, got with it. We had to um, chop them off, and and then uh, the the productivity slowed down. And the next year it got worse. More branches uh, started to to kind of die off. And so uh, even in the first year, it, uh, my dad got worried. We got all the professionals to look at it. They they looked at it and said, "Well, let's spray, spray all sorts of um, good stuff." And and sort of next year it's even worse. So then he gets a new team, you know, of of three professionals. I don't know who they were. But they kind of look at it. They they know all about apricots, and they say, "Well, maybe you need to put this this kind of." thing around, um, you know, fertilize it, you, um, uh, water it and trim it and all of those kind of aspects. Next year it, got, it gets even worse to the point that it actually dies completely. And to our um, utter dismay, we had to totally pluck it out. And when we removed the tree, it was a massive tree, apricots, yeah? And so when we removed the tree, we realized that there was bug I can't even translate now into the, even, even don't remember, was actually eating from, from un, underneath. So it was actually an empty spot there where the, the root was. It was all eating away. And, and so if we even left the tree, it would have been empty on the inside at some point. Yeah, so it was almost eaten uh, from within. And so I, um, I kind of use this illustration as, uh, as, as an example or as a lesson. We can talk about relationships. We can trim, uh, you know, with the branches. We can fertilize. We can spray and do all of those external um, tricks which are necessary when the root is healthy. So, but it will be much easier for all of us to, to trim and address the area of, say, communication. Let's actually run a seminar on communication skills. And it's a fabulous uh, tool for all the families to, uh, to, um, uh, to really uh, master, to know, how do I talk to my wife when, you know, in a, in a situation? Do I say this or do I say that? How do I approach it? They are all great skills. Um, well, let's talk about anger management. And then we will talk about anger management, or how is, is the conflict resolution. And we will be talking about all the conflict resolution techniques. But if the emotional health and mental health is the real cause, don't you worry about uh, running all the workshops and seminars on communication, on conflict management, on relationships, on anything, unless until you address the real thing, 
which is our mental and emotional mind. Can I share this verse with you? Um, it comes from NIV version, and it goes like this. Uh, Proverbs 4.23, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Now, according to this verse, what, what actually produces or determines the course of our life? Our thinking. So, in fact, this verse, when it says, guard your heart, the Bible doesn't refer to our organ that pumps our blood, but it actually refers to our mind. 